This episode goes out to iTunes reviewer Kim1575. Your review made our day. Hi there, Garrett Robinson here. Welcome to the second episode of the Nightblade Epic Podcast Season 3. Okay, today I have one quick announcement, and it's that some friends and I have launched a new show. I know, that sounds crazy, but don't worry, I'm not betraying this podcast or leaving it behind, I promise. For over a year now, some close friends from my local mead hall and I have been playing the best game of Dungeons & Dragons that I've ever experienced. It's become a really important part of my life. And this year we decided that we wanted to take a crack at turning it into a show. And so we did. And it just launched. The show is called Natural 20 Proof, and it's an awesome combination of tabletop gaming and good drinks. We broadcast our D&D campaign every Sunday at noon Pacific time, and it comes to YouTube the following Thursday. Plus, if you don't have time to watch the video, we also release it as a podcast every Friday. Just go to your favorite platform, Twitch, YouTube, or your podcasting app, and search for Nat 20 Proof. That's N-A-T-2-0 P-R-O-O-F. This show has been a lot of fun to put together, and I think you're going to love it. Okay, now it's time for today's episode. Today, you're getting Chapter 3 of Darkfire. When we left off, Jordell had told Lauren about the Mage Stone sickness plaguing Zane and also about the ancient origins of her mysterious dagger. Enjoy! Darkfire, Chapter 3 All that day they rode, the rain coming harder the farther they went. It kept them from driving the horses, and Lauren saw Jordel's frustration slowly mount. Every so often she caught the mystic glancing back at Zane, as though he thought the wizard could somehow have summoned the storm that plagued them. But that was madness. If Zane could have conjured his powers, he would have cast off his bonds and fled in an instant. And he would not have brought rain to pester them, but more likely flame to burn them all. Lauren shuddered at the thought. Mayup she imagined it, or mayup she was looking for it now, but each time she looked at Zane, he seemed to be faring worse. An unhealthy white sheen had come over his skin, and she did not think the rain could make his skin quite so clammy. His eyes darted everywhere, and his arms would not cease their twitching. She could imagine him wanting to scratch himself, the way he had in Wellmont after he had first started taking the mage stones. Jordel pushed them to ride after sundown, until the very last light had almost faded from the cloudy sky. Then he hastily found a site for their camp, in the lee of a tall hill where the ground had not been soaked quite so badly. Once again Lauren gave quiet thanks for her fine bedroll. Their eager pace paid off. Before noon the next day they spotted the lights and smoke of a village ahead on the road. Almost at the same moment the rain began to lighten. Soon it had reduced to little more than a drizzle, and Jem lowered his hood with a whoop of laughter. At last! How I have longed for a real bed and some warm food in my belly! And you will have both, though we have precious little time to waste, said Jordel. Be sure to enjoy it. Though his words were gruff, Lauren could hear the relief in his voice. Whatever this place was, it seemed to be some sort of sign to Jordel a sign that if danger had not found their party yet, the chances of it happening would lessen greatly hereafter. "'That will be the village of Strapa,' said Jordel. "'It sits at the joining of Selvin's westerly road and the smaller road that leads to Wellmont, which no king of Selvin has seen fit to name. No horseman or caravan may travel this way without passing through it, unless they wish to journey for many miles around.' "'Curious that I have never heard of it,' said Annis. My family's wagons venture often upon the westerly road. They do, but they would never stop in such an insignificant place as this, said Jordel. They would carry on to Sunvale, a few more hours ride north. 
A league before they reached the first houses of Strapa, Jordel turned them left and off the road. Mountains loomed up above them now, and the hills at their feet were coated thick with pine. Into the trees he led them, picking an unerring path through their trunks until the outside world was lost from view. Not for the first time, Loren was struck by the skill of his woodcraft, and wondered where he had learned it. When they had reached a small clearing far from the edge of the wood, Jordel commanded them to stop. A large pile of rocks lay at the clearing's west edge, forming a small sort of cave that the rain could not reach. The mystic dismounted, handing his reins to Loren, and went to inspect the caves with his sword drawn. Once he had been in and out of the rocks and inspected them all around, he returned with a grim smile. It is empty, and no tracks or droppings have been left for many a long month, he declared. It will serve. Serve for what? said Jem. To hold our unusual cargo, of course. Did you think to enter the village with a wizard trussed up on my horse, like a fallen stag? Lauren was surprised she had not thought of that herself. The sight of Strapa had been so welcome after their long and wet days upon the road that she had had little thought for anything other than finding the first inn she could. But of course Jordel was right. They could not haul Zane along with them as they refreshed their supplies. Jordel lifted Zane down and deposited him within the cave, sheltered from the sky by the rocks that sat overhead. Then he produced another coil of rope from his saddlebag, and worked behind the wizard for a moment to secure his wrists to the boulders. "'That will do,' he said. "'Come, we can ease our horse's burden somewhat. Jem, you will ride with me.' "'You mean to leave him here alone?' said Jem, aghast. Lauren spoke up as well. "'That seems unwise, Jordel. I thought you meant to leave a guard.' Jordel looked at them with a small smile, a light dancing in his eyes. "'You forget that once I was a hunter tasked with finding men like Zane. He shall not break the bonds I placed upon him.' "'But if he should?' said Annis, her voice quivering. She looked from Zane to Lauren, as though seeking reassurance. Her hand shook as she clutched Lauren's back, and Lauren felt pity well up in her breast. "'If he should manage to escape—' Will he not come looking for vengeance? Jordel looked at her with kindly eyes, but Jem's face grew melancholy, and he slid from the saddle to stand before the mystic. We cannot just leave him here, mayhap for some wandering soul to discover. I will stay and keep watch over him. Only do not forget to fetch me some food, for I may well starve before you return. Lauren tried not to laugh. Jordel put a hand on Jem's shoulder and answered him solemnly. "'Your offer is a valiant one, young rogue, and I thank you for it. But I have told you that Zane will not escape, and I ask you to believe me. Even if I am proved wrong, you could not keep him here if he were unbound.' Jem lifted his chin. "'I could stop him.' "'I will not doubt you,' said Jordel. "'But I will feed you. And Annis, if by some chance he should break his ropes, I do not think he would seek us out. More likely he would flee from here as fast as his feet could carry him, and hope to avoid us for all the rest of his days. Trust me, and come. They mounted and left. Lauren looked back over her shoulder once before they left the clearing, to see Zane staring after her with a baleful glare. Just before he vanished from sight, she saw him begin to struggle against the rope that bound his wrists. It made her shiver, but she forced herself to believe in Jordel. He was a mage hunter, after all. Who knew better than he how to restrain a wizard? Jordel must have sensed their unease, for as they picked their way through the forest, he spoke to them lightly. Strapa is not a place to leave your purse strings unguarded, and yet it is no grim village either. Any hub of trade will attract wandering villains and thieves, but those who live here are good folk, for the most part. Keep a clear eye and a strong bearing, and you shall find no trouble. We will fetch ourselves new supplies quickly, and then continue north on the westerly road. It seems that Selvin is thick with those who pursue us, said Annis. Not only my family, but the mystics as well. Why do we not travel through Dorsey, west of the mountains? That would put us farther from danger. 
The borders of Dorsey will not stop my order, nor your kin, said Jordell. And indeed, I think they will guess that that is our destination. Thus, we must not go there. Furthermore, with war brewing between that kingdom and this, travelers from Selvin would be most unwelcome. You are a child of the courts and gem of the streets. You might disguise your voices, but Lauren's heavy accent would do us no favors in that land. Lauren turned so quickly in surprise she nearly fell out of her saddle. What accent? I speak as plainly as any other. Indeed, said Jordell with a faint smile. As plainly as anyone from the Birchwood born and raised in the kingdom of Selvin, as anyone listening to you could plainly hear. Jem laughed out loud. Annis giggled. There is no reason to be upset, Lauren. He speaks only the truth. Your voice is quite... Regional. It is not, cried Lauren. No, it is quite impossible to hear you have come from the forest, raised in a small village by parents who most likely chopped wood, said Jem, speaking in an outlandish fashion, lilting the first sound of every word. That sounds nothing like me. Lauren was growing angrier by the second. You had best still your tongue, Jem. A light danced in Annis's eyes. Or she might beat you with her great wood-chopping arms. Lauren hunched her shoulders and cast her hood over her face, fuming while Jem and Annis continued their jibes. At least the children were happy again, and the air seemed to have grown less stale somehow. Zane's presence had been a heavy weight upon them, and now his absence freed their tongues and lightened their hearts. So they came at last to the village of Strapa, Little more than a few buildings clustered in the looming shadow of the Great Rocks. Lauren saw several homes, not dissimilar to the houses of her village in the Birchwood, sending a curious pang of homesickness shooting through her. Never before had she found cause to miss her village, for no fond memories had ever drawn her mind there. Any times of happiness had been with Chet, or the old storyteller, Bracken, and all were dwarfed by the looming shadow of her parents. Yet now, seeing this simple place against the backdrop of the mountains that rose above, she thought there was something noble to a life lived in such a place. True, her youth had not been easy, but many in her village had seemed happy, as did many she saw walking the streets of Strapa now. She had seen much excitement since fleeing the Birchwood, and much peril. She could hardly imagine returning to a life such as this. And yet, to her surprise, Some part of her missed it, longing for the day when her greatest fear had been not chopping enough logs to please her father. But as their horses picked a slow, careful path through the streets, Lauren thought she saw some truth in the warning Jordel had given. Many curious eyes watched them as they went, and not all sat in friendly faces. A goodly number seemed to be sizing up the party, as if looking over a meal before feasting. But Jordel's frame was impressive, and he carried a broad sword at his waist. And though Lauren bore no open weapon, still she was tall for a girl. She threw back her shoulders, trying to look larger, and when she caught their glances they must have seen something in her eyes to deter them, for they quickly averted their own. Streets spread out from the town's middle like the spokes of a wagon wheel. As they neared the center, houses gave way to inns and taverns and shops of trade. From its center, four roads led away, one to the southwest that ran to Wellmont, one to the southeast from which they had come, another north where they were bound, and finally one narrow road with buildings pressing close on either side that went northwest. "'Where does that road lead?' said Lauren, nodding. Jordel followed her gaze. "'You have a sharp eye.' That road leads out of Strapa and into the Great Rocks themselves. There is a pass that leads through the mountains, along perilous heights and into deep valleys. It does not see much travel, for it is a treacherous journey. A secret mountain pass, said Jem, his eyes all alight. Why do we not take that path, Jordel? It seems to suit our purpose, to hide us from watchful eyes upon the open road. Lauren had thought the same thing, but Jordell shook his head firmly. "'I considered it as we rode north,' he said. "'But that way lies great danger, 
and I fear it would add weeks to our journey, or may up months. Now more than ever, secrecy must give way to speed. Time pulls us ever nearer to our doom, and faster the closer we draw. That made them fall silent, and they stayed mute as Jordell led them to an inn. There a stable boy took their horses, with many curious glances at Lauren's green eyes. Jordell slipped him a copper sliver. Inside, the common room had hardly an empty seat. The rain had driven the town's inhabitants into the warmth of fire and ale. Though the place was boisterously loud and everyone seemed too interested in drink and conversation to notice four weary travelers, still Lauren felt exposed as they stood upon the threshold, searching for somewhere to sit. There are too many eyes in this place, said Jordel quietly. I had not counted on such a crowd. It will go ill for us if our presence here is remarked. Yet we stand like fools when food awaits, said Jem, licking his lips. I think I smell a stew. Mayup staying in the town is ill-advised, said Jordel. It might be better to return to the forest. Annis and Jem gave a loud groan. Lauren, too, loathed the idea of spending another night upon the muddy ground, and already she could imagine the comfort of a straw mattress beneath her. "'Jordel, we are soaked through,' she said quickly. "'The children might fall ill if we press on too hard. We shall do ourselves no favors if we exceed our limits, and the road grows ever longer. If any here would remark upon us, they could have done so in the streets.' Jordel's mouth twisted. Very well, but we eat in our room, and we leave at first light. Jem gave a tiny whoop. They went to the back of the room, where the innkeeper was already eyeing them greedily. Jordel gave her coin, and she had a serving girl lead them to a room with a single mattress. Soon they had filled their bellies with meat and broth, and sat in lazy silence and contentment. I would wager you are happy we stopped here now, mystic, said Jem. Jem, be quiet, snapped Lauren. If I hear that word from you even once more, I shall make you regret it. Indeed, you should use more care, said Jordell. I do not trust the thickness of these walls, but I will not deny that I am grateful for a hot meal. We will have few enough of them before Feldemar. Must you always douse my hopes, said Jem, flopping over on his stomach in a huff. Lauren found herself still preoccupied with her strange homesickness, and said nothing. Annis looked at her with interest, picking a bit of gristle from between her teeth. "'You are curiously quiet, Lauren. Whatever troubles you?' "'Nothing,' said Lauren, shaking her head. "'This place. It brings to mind the village I came from, that is all. "'Longings for home are no strange thing for a traveler,' said Jordel. You have heard enough of my past to know I have little reason to miss the birchwood, said Lauren, and a bitterness crept into her words. Reason rarely governs the heart, said Jordel softly. I have met boys whose fathers were taken with drink, or horrid memories of war, or who simply had black hearts. They were beaten every day since they could walk, the father seeking revenge on his own flesh and blood for a pain that can never be soothed. Yet when these boys told me of the day their fathers died, they wept hot and bitter tears. Few hold only hatred for home and family, no matter how justified. I do, said Lauren fiercely. I would die before returning. I think you speak from your own mind and know little of ours, Jordell. The three of us have suffered much in our youth at the hands of those who should have protected us. She looked to Jem and Annis for support. Yet Jem did not meet her eyes, but merely stared at his fingernails and picked at them with his small knife. Annis pulled her cloak around her a bit tighter, then raised her gaze. "'I have little wish to return to my mother,' she said quietly. "'Yet not all my memories of her are ill. She used to take me to the sea that surrounds the High King's seat, and together we would play in the waves. She did not even bring retainers or any guards that I could see. She stopped when I grew older.' Yet if she had always acted thus, I might not have wished to leave so badly. Lauren turned away from her to stare at the wall. You had a luckier childhood than I did, then. Did I? said Annis bitterly. 
Things changed when I grew older. How often did your father bring you to a deep pit beneath your castle, there to show you how he killed people slowly for information? Did he ever ask you to pick up the knife and join him? Lauren's ears burned with shame and embarrassment, but she did not turn to let Anna see it. We are granted little choice in the way we come to this world, nor whom we enter it with, said Jordel from his chair by the door. Yet we hold great sway in what we do after. You all fled your homes because of something inside you, some special fire, like a torch that lit your choice clearly. Not all would take such an opportunity. Though that flame be born from hardship, you should not spurn it. I would rather have had parents who were not cruel, and who raised me to be a simple woodsman's daughter, said Lauren. Free from excitement I might be now, but also free from peril. Neither would I object to such a life, said Jem. But Annis looked at both of them with sharp eyes. I think you miss your guess about yourselves, the both of you. Together we have walked many miles, and I think I know something of your hearts. I could not see either of you living a simple life in the woods or in a noble's manner. You would be as out of place there as an oliphant in the high king's court. None of us are the sort who are meant for that life. I think we are meant for this. She gestured vaguely about them with her hands. And what is this, exactly? said Jem. Our life, said Annis, simply. Do you not see that it suits us? I cannot see how any of us might have taken a different road than this. So says the merchant's daughter, said Lauren, though she did not mean it to sound so scornful as it came out. These are somber thoughts, said Jordel quickly, and it is ill-advised to dwell on them, for we must keep our wits about us. We need provisions for the road ahead. Lauren, will you come with me? What of us? said Jem, at the same time as Annis. Far too many have seen us already, said Jordel. I would rather not reinforce the tale of four travelers bearing our descriptions, all traveling together. There is safety in numbers, they say, yet fewer may avoid being seen entirely. Sleep if you can, or else wait quietly, but neither leave the room nor answer the door if any knock but us. They left the inn to emerge into the drizzle again. Lauren still plagued by too many thoughts of home. This has been a production of Legacy Books, written and narrated by Garrett Robinson. The music in this podcast was created by Will Musser. Check out his incredible work at willmusser.com. That's W-I-L-L-M-U-S-S-E-R dot com. Today's letter is M. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.